Okay, look, we're gonna have to talk about it. So this is something that I really didn't wanna have to make a video about, but I think I've done some harm to somebody that I've always considered a friend. And I wanna make this video because maybe you too have been affected by the same issue. And this is something that happens when you watch the Jonathan Schrantz channel. And there's something that we need to take a moment kind of as a community to sort out and get to the bottom of. And I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on it. And also, if you are here for chess, you clicked on this video, there is going to be chess, but just hear me out. Let me get something off my chest uh, right as we start. And I don't really have anything planned. I'm just kind of spitballing here. But this is actually kind of an important issue to me because sometimes I have some concerns about the kind of stuff that I put on this channel. Now, I am a YouTuber and I usually like to make videos about openings that are particularly unusual, which often means that they're very unsound, but I'm looking for things that are fun to play, they're very creative, these are the kinds of things that draw my attention. However, not all gambits are that good as it turns out, and some openings are so bad, and they have absolutely no purpose or no reason to exist, and sometimes I kind of want to show it and be like, hey, here's like a very bad opening, but you should not play it. But for whatever reason, this does not get through to people. People just keep playing this horrible stuff over and over. And I try to specify, I understand I'm a YouTuber. When you click on the video, generally you're like, okay, this is this guy's recommendation, but I'm very clear. I'm like, literally do not play it. And today we are going to be talking about an opening that I literally do not want you to play. There is no purpose to it it's just a really really bad opening but somehow even very popular streamers have been brainwashed into playing this and just last night at 1 a.m this happened so i actually i saw this opening in a uh, vampire chicken thumbnail vampire chicken aka jonathan trance posted a video about this opening i didn't actually watch the video but i saw the thumbnail and it looked like a funny opening so this is my first time playing it but little did Eric know that he was actually moments away from disaster and he would not only go on to lose this game, but with it, he lost 11 hard earned rating points. And I know what you must be thinking. You're like, wow, what is this dubious gambit and how do I start playing it immediately? No, that is bad. I am being dead serious. I am literally saying this one should not exist. It has no point to it whatsoever. There are no tricky challenges. It's just a bad opening. It's something that you really want to avoid, but it is something that you can play against the English, and we are going to be taking a look at exactly what this gambit is. I'm going to show you the Eric Rosen game, although, honestly, I'm not really going to analyze any of these very deeply because it's just such a trash opening. It doesn't really deserve any high-level commentary. Then I'm going to be showing you the game that Eric referenced on his stream. I'm going to show you the analysis of that one, and honestly, I'll explain why I didn't even really want to publish it in the first place. We'll get into that story later. And then I'm even going to show you a third game, which is what originally inspired me to look at this gambit in the first place. But this is something that you can play against the English, like if you're, I don't know, if you want to lose all of your games, but it starts with this move, pawn to b5, and this already has a name. This is the Johnish Gambits. Now, in typical Schrantz Gambit style, what I normally do is I take some sort of mainline gambit or something, but I try to dig even deeper and make it even more dubious, and that's what happens here, although this one, again, was kind of a failed experiment that didn't go so well. Now, usually, when people put it, like, the, the real line that we're going to look at here is something you cannot, if you haven't seen it yet, you have no idea what black is going to play in this position. But the usual way of playing the Johnish Gambit is to play something like a6. And this by itself is already a pretty bad opening because it's basically a Banco Gambit, but a lot worse because this pawn's not yet to d4, which gives white the option of playing d3. Like, let me just play kind of the most normal, typical moves uh, that are played on Lee Chess. Normally people are going like this, they're going like this. At some moments, you know, maybe we get castled, we get developed. Looks like people are playing c6. d3 really makes this bishop look silly on a6. So this one already is like a worse Banco Gambit, something that should be avoided. However, we are going to dig a little bit deeper into this one because after b5 and the opponent takes, the move that Eric saw in the thumbnail is g5. <laughs> now, I got to tell you, this is like plus three for white. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to chess. You should never do it, okay? It's like a grob, but even worse because you've double grobbed on both sides. Not going to work. And Eric's Rosen opponent 
easily refuted it by just playing in the center. His opponent went d4, Eric played g4, notice how the pawn was attacked by the bishop, then comes e4, look at this, white keeps developing in the center, attacking the pawn, so Eric needs to put more stuff on the side, he needs to play h5, and then h3 comes, and guess what? White has a totally killer position, it's like plus four, easily winning. Like, okay, easiest thing to refute in the world. But, and that's it. I mean, we're not going to analyze this game anymore. That's enough. Like, I'm already sick of it. But he was inspired by this game uh, that I'm about to show you right now. And the reason that I posted the original game of me playing against just some random opponent on... Um, on Lee Chess the other day, is that uh, from here, I had a really nice tactic later in the game, and that's basically all you can hope for. If you play it, know that you're insanely losing. It's basically just a troll opening, but uh, I had a really cool tactic, so I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna post it. At all risk that people might associate me with this ridiculous move, I am gonna post this video, but here's what happened in my game. Now, my opponent made a big mistake of not controlling the center right away. Like again, you should just play d4, e4, h3, and basically this opening is totally rubbish. But instead of that, we got d3, to which my pawn is attacked, I played g4. Opponent played knight to c3, I played bishop to g7, e4, h5, and I'm just playing on the flanks. And I'm actually not gonna touch my center pawns for quite a long time uh, and just focus on playing on the side of the board. Here, my opponent plays bishop g5. Okay, this is kind of an interesting one. Now my pawn's pinned. Maybe he's just kind of jumping into these squares as they are kind of damaged. And I play a6, just kind of keeping up the meme of playing on both sides, just playing on both flanks of the board. Now I play bishop to a6. And my opponent hasn't really taken full control of the center, but it still obviously is very solid. But at some point, he is running into some sort of issues that it's not easy to develop both of these pieces because at least at this moment, uh, they both need to use this e2 square. That's why this pawn maybe should be a little bit farther. Maybe you need to be playing h3. But instead, we see queen to d2. And I kind of suspect that maybe my opponent had some sort of system in mind. And maybe he plays the English and then he always plays like kind of the same moves. I don't really know. Uh, because it felt like he just followed some sort of like normal plan. But obviously, I've, I've destroyed whatever the normal plan is. Is. Knight to e2 is what comes, and now I sense this opportunity to play knight to e5. Look, if your pawns aren't going to be in the center of the board, well, at least then you can use your pieces <laughs> to jump into the center. Here I'm attacking the d3 pawn, so his knight needs to move again. It goes to c1. I play rook to b8, and I'm kind of sensing there might be some sort of tactic deep in the future, and that's really all you're doing. If you play nonsense, you're just saying, like, I'm going to find a tactic whenever the game gets complicated. I'm going to play for maximal confusion and try to find the tactic and win the game. So I already have this alignment going on, but I think my opponent kind of had the same sense as well. And he plays rook to b1. So I'm playing somebody, you know, when you play the English, you're probably a solid player anyway. But here is just ultra mega solid, trying to defend against all of the threats before I can even make them. And it's a very respectable way to play. I play knight to f6, b3, okay, like really trying to be safe over there. But now I play h4. And now all of a sudden, I might be able to generate some sort of weaknesses on the king side. And after all, when you're pushing on the flank, that's basically basically your idea. I'm going to try to weaken that side of the board. I'm going to take all the space and I'm going to try to weaken it. He brings out his bishop to e2. I play pawn to e3. And now I'm actually starting to get a little bit excited that I might have some potential in this position because look at these light squares. There's all sorts of weaknesses. Uh, and I decide to play rook to h5. And it's kind of interesting. I've gotten, without moving any of my center pawns, I've kind of gotten all of my pieces involved into the game. I just need to somehow get this queen over here and I'd have everybody good to go. So I attack his bishop. The bishop does decide to move away. And now finally, on move 15, I move one of my pawns in like the center for the first time. I play pawn to c5, taking control over this square. Uh, he plays bishop takes e5, which was a little bit of a surprise. I just simply take back with my rook. He castles and I play d5. Look at that. Uh, having played on the flanks for as long as I possibly could, I am now playing in the center. But f4, this is the moment of the game. And the move that I played here is the reason that I posted this video because I actually had a really cool tactical idea in this position. So go ahead and pause if you want to try to solve it, but it's, it's black to play and win. And I had a very nice conception. And essentially that's what you do. You play the dumb gambit. You hope that there's something brilliant. Haha, -ha, I did it. I played a really cool game. So I decided to publish it to the second channel, the Vampire Chicken channel. Uh, it's where I post all of my Blitz games. And I'm like, you know, whatever. And my idea was that I may be able to sacrifice my rook and take advantage of some of these weak diagonals that have been created when I pushed my h-pawn all the way up the board. And I played d takes e4. 
sacrificing the rook, my opponent took it, and my idea, of course, was to play queen to d4. And look at this. It's not very easy to block this check, and you're going to have to walk onto another very dangerous diagonal. Like if you play rook to f2, which I guess would be the other way to block, I'm just simply going to play pawn to e3, and you are in a lot of trouble. This is going to be an excellent position for black. So my opponent decided he needed to go into the corner, and now... I switch back with the bishop, <laughs> and my bishop comes to this diagonal, and I just threaten to open the position by moving my e-pawn, and now he's in what I thought was a lot of trouble, but he came up with kind of a cool defensive resource, sensing that there was a lot of imminent danger. He tries bishop to f3. This was kind of a cool little move. He's shutting down this diagonal. He has to give at least a bishop back, but now when I take, I'm again threatening to go here with checkmate, because look at my bishop, uh, and he decides to play rook to f2, which was expected. Now my knight is hanging, okay? He's getting attacked by a pawn. I move my knight away. He takes, I take back with the bishop, and there's one more tactic to go. He plays pawn to b4. I think it's actually just almost impossible for white to do anything. Looks like maybe he's trying to create a square for this knight to be able to escape. But now I played bishop h6, <laughs> trying to remove the defender of the rook. And to my surprise and to my delight, it's not very easy to play anything as black. Like if you actually play the best move, okay, whatever, my bishop's coming in. This is very, very dangerous for white. But to my delight, my opponent did take, perhaps sensing that this could be some sort of double rook sacrifice. Maybe he's coming in. And I took his rook and this is where my opponent opponent resigned because obviously checkmate is imminent. I was kind of hoping that he would give this check and just look at this. I could have sacrificed literally everything and then I would have played checkmate. Probably this one. All these squares are mate. Probably I would have gone to this square. It's the least expected. But that was the game that I played and I published because it had that cool tactic. However, I was kind of influenced by this game. And this was just some random game played in some Canes tournament in France back in 1995. It was the C section. It was two not very famous French chess players. But I saw this game, and I saw this game without the engine. And this is... Uh, I'm not even going to try to say these names. You can read them. Um, but I, I saw this game and it really like inspired me, or at least I thought like when I first saw G5, I'm like, oh, that's a cool idea. But like a lot of gambits, you dig a little bit deeper into it and you're like, oh, okay, actually it's just dumb. You just play in the center, you play H3 and you just refute it. Okay, that's okay. Dumb opening, move on is what you usually do. But for some reason it was stuck in my head. But then I went back and I checked this game and I'm like, this is a horrible game. As soon as you turn the engine on, you're like, well, this is garbage. <laughs> you should never do that. Engines have kind of ruined this game. I thought it was cool, and we're going to check it out, because it has kind of a cool checkmating sequence in it. But again, we see a game in which white does not fully conquer the center right away, which, okay, that gives you a game. Maybe you got something playable. H4, uh, sorry, H5 is what was played. Bishop comes out to E2, and now knight to F6. Okay, this is like how we're going to do it. B3, interesting idea. White is trying to develop this bishop. And a lot of times when you play the English, maybe that's where they like to put their bishop. Uh, bishop to G7, bishop to B2, G4. And all of a sudden, we get to these this common situation where at least you're cramping white style. At least the knight doesn't have such an easy time getting out. But white does find H3, which is the usual solution to this problem. Bishop went to b7. This is kind of interesting because now the black bishops are doing a lot of work. They're doing the crisscross all the way across the board. B pawn is under attack, so white needs to play the rook. And at least you're forcing white, I guess you say to yourself, to make some very uncomfortable moves. Now a6 is what was played. B takes a6, knight takes a6, knight to c3. Here, black came up with kind of a cheeky little move. Queen to b8, lining up from a very far distance on this rook. A lot of beginners might blunder a rook here. <laughs> After h takes, c5, not recapturing right away, but instead setting up this kind of cunning threat, long-ranged attack against the rook. Because the other issue for white is that if the rook moves, the g-pawn is also under attack. And you can see just kind of the power of focusing on some of these diagonals if you do play one of these ridiculous flank openings. It's the kind of thing white needs to avoid. White plays pawn to g3. That seems very sensible. And now h4 exploiting this pin. This is like how what his main conception was. White tries to play pawn to f4. And now, while this is still very bad for black, at least you have this pesky pawn that is kind of snuck in to g3. And this is black is kind of relying on this for some sort of counterplay. Because after takes takes, we saw g5 attacking the knight. Knight hops into e4. Queen to c2. Knight to b4. Queen to c2 was actually not a very good move. It just lets the black knight come in with tempo. Queen had to go back to b1, and now knight to f2. And 
Uh, this actually is a horrible mistake. The knight had a very important purpose on the e4 square because now the queen gets to come all the way in. Uh-oh, and suddenly black is actually in a lot of trouble but plays d6. Okay, you kind of got to give up a pawn. And all of a sudden it looks very hopeless because the queen comes off, the rook takes back, but at least there's still this pawn. And while it doesn't really look like there's going to be any mating threats against this white king, you never know. Look at this. We got this knight coming into c2. There's all sorts of things going on. So rook to b1. Uh, the rook needs to kind of get out of the way. And now this rook comes over to the h file. And look at this. Maybe this rook is coming into one of these squares. Bishop to f3 is what was played. This keeps the rook out of this particular square. But now knight to c2. And here is where black kind of makes a very critical mistake. The king here needs to run over to this pawn. If white ever takes this g pawn, it's just gg. White is going to win. However, the king bong clouded to e2, allowing bishop to a6. This bishop just keeps kind of jumping around, finding all of the diagonals. And that's kind of the point of a flank opening. Use the bishops and kind of torture your opponent. d3 is what was played. But as we can kind of see, like there's a box around the king that's slowly beginning to form. Now the rook comes to h2, and we are perhaps threatening to take this pawn. Uh, he didn't do it right away. He wants to maybe take with a knight and set up some sort of mating net. Bishop to g4 is what was played. Uh, white is getting very desperate, and you can kind of tell. Look at these knights. They're really controlling all of these squares. The bishop's controlling this square. All you really need is the rook to take advantage of this. So white gives up a piece in order to be able to move in, attack this knight, and this is g-pawn. But now, uh, we see the knight get defended, and I guess presumably after this, rook to g2 is what was happening, but maybe this is a playable line. Instead, we see the bishop go to c1, uh, bishop to b2. Look at this. How many times does the bishop just go back and forth and it just keeps giving all of the checks? And this actually forces white. I guess maybe it doesn't force white uh, to take. You could maybe play knight to e4, which probably is better knowing what happened in the game. But this is what happened. And now it's actually just a mate in five. And it's kind of out of nowhere, all of these pieces just infiltrated into the white camp. And rook to g2 leads to a checkmate. Uh, the king went here. Knight to f2 check. King to h4, you can see how it's all being set up. Knight to f5, you have to go to h5, rook to h2, checkmate. And this was the game that inspired me, but hopefully it doesn't inspire you. And if you would like to lose all of your rating points, please subscribe for more or just subscribe because we're close to 50,000. I appreciate it. Bye.